Welcome to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. I'm your host, Jamie Irvin. In this episode, we are going to talk about the sales trends that we have seen with Heavy Duty Parts over approximately the last nine months. We're going to talk about for fleets, why it's so important to understand what's going on with the cost of parts and to bring that right down to the VMRS level. And we're going to conclude the episode by talking about why it's so important to have the right information when ordering parts. Let's get started. At the Heavy Duty Consulting Corporation, we have been working with manufacturers and distributors throughout this, what we would call a freight recession. And it definitely has had an impact on the volume of parts that are being ordered by fleets, repair shops, and owner operators. If you were to look at the last six months of 2023, we saw a declining sales revenue for most manufacturers and distributors. When you talk to people, there was a little bit of nervous energy when you talk to them. They would say things like, well, we're pretty flat or, well, we're down a little bit. But if you look behind the, uh, let's say, those responses and actually looked at the numbers, what we found with our clients is that most people were down anywhere from 5 to 25% in the second half of 2023. Now, the first quarter of Q1 wasn't much better. When I talk to people at a lot of the trade shows like HDAW, like at TMC's annual meeting or HDA Truck Pride's annual meeting, even at the beginning of April, there was very little optimism. But somewhere around the very end of March into the first part of April and into, let's say, the first part of May, when I attended Diesel Connect in Phoenix, all of a sudden, things started to change. We noticed it at the Heavy Duty Consulting Corporation. We signed a number of new clients. There was a significant uptick in uh, people willing to spend money and invest in their business. And we heard from our clients that at the manufacturing and distribution level, and even all the way down to the repair shop level, volumes in April and May were definitely much stronger than they had been in a long time with some companies actually having record months in April and May. So we definitely feel like we are coming to the end of the classic truckload cycle. We've definitely been kind of bumping along the bottom of that cycle for a number of months now. And although it might be a little too early to officially say the freight recession is over, the impacts of it seem to have flattened out and we may even start to see a curve upwards. Now, keeping track of these trends is very important uh, because you have to make strategic decisions accordingly. The reality is we know that there isn't going to be a big boom in the next couple of years. At very best, economists are calling for modest GDP growth. We know there's going to be a lot of activity in infrastructure because of the infrastructure bill in the US. We also know that consumer spending with inflation being as high as it is, with debt loads being as high as they are is probably not going to be as strong as it was in some past years. So although we may see some small growth, that consumer-driven uh, freight and tonnage may not be there. So at this point, we are recommending to our clients that they are very, very conservative in their numbers and that they do what they can to conserve as much cash as possible in the business so as to give themselves a buffer should there be further decline in overall revenue. So that's what we're seeing industry-wide. Those are the things we're hearing from our clients, what we're seeing at the shows. If you want to, when we post about this on LinkedIn, on social media, make sure you comment and let us know what you're seeing. The more information we have from the market, the better it is and the more accurate uh, the, the data we can provide you, our listeners, and of course, our clients. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break right now, and after the break, we're going to talk about why it's so important for fleets to keep track of parts costs right down to the VMRS level. We'll be right back. Are you deferring maintenance because of filter cost or availability? Or worse yet, are you trading down to no-name filters to try to save a few bucks? Either way, you're rolling the dice. The good news, there's a new premium filter option for fleets, Hanks Filtration. If you're responsible for a fleet, you won't believe how much using Hanks filters will save you. But you've got to go to heavydutypartsreport.com 
slash Hanks to find out more. That's heavydutypartsreport.com slash H-E-N-G-S-T. Head there now. At Diesel Laptops, they go way beyond diagnostic tools. They are your complete shop efficiency partner. From diesel technician training to complete repair information, parts lookup tools, and robust technical support, they are there to support you every step of the way. Learn more and download your free starter pack today by visiting diesellaptops.com. That's diesellaptops.com. We're back from our break. Before the break, we were talking about the heavy-duty parts sales trends at the manufacturing and distribution level over, let's say, roughly the last nine months and where we might think it will go in the next few months. And now it's time for our featured interview. In this interview, we're going to talk about where the parts cost trends actually are and uh, what that indicates about the future. And we're going to talk about why this information needs to be available to fleets, where to get access to this information, and why it's so important to track it right down to the VMRS level. I hope you enjoyed this week's interview. My guest today is Dick Hyatt, CEO and President at Decisive. Now, Dick has years of experience building, managing, and growing early stage technology companies, including Sage Systems, uh, Automation Partners, Hayes Ligon, which was sold to ADP Dealer Services, and Amtiva Technology, which was sold to Cisco Systems. Now, he has spent over 20 years at Decisive focused on building a world-class team of industry and technology experts, and delivering high-quality, profit-improving products and services for the heavy-duty industry. Dick, welcome to the Heavy-Duty Parts Report. So glad to have you here. Jimmy, thanks for, thanks for having us. Um, I really look forward to this. Uh, love the work that you're doing, so appreciate the time. Thank you. And you're not alone today. We also have another guest. So Nick is the Director of Data Services at Decisive, and He's a data analytic leader with 17 years in the financial service industry and six years in the commercial trucking industry. So no, no stranger to the commercial side of the business. At Decisive, his key responsibilities include identifying key insights, driving future efficiencies across the Decisive SRM ecosystem, and delivering data products to bring actionable, I like that word, actionable information into the hands of Decisive customers. Nick, welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Good afternoon, Jamie. Thank you for having me. Gentlemen, before we get started into our discussion today, I thought we could take a moment to give our listeners a little bit of background on Decisive. Some of them may not be familiar with your company. Dick, could you do that for us? Yeah, Jamie, thank you. I appreciate that opportunity. And again, uh, thanks for, uh, for working with us. Yeah, Decisive has been in business for over 20 years. As you mentioned, I, I founded the business, started the business with a lot of help from a number of other folks, and we've been growing it over the past couple of decades. Um, we have kind of a special niche. We work closely with truck and trailer uh, and component OEMs. We provide them with a branded service management solution that they then take uh, and deploy across their service networks and fleets. Many people have come in contact with our products under uh, various different brand names from uh, from these OEMs. And what we do is really connect vital and connected uh, diagnostic data, prognostics, and more and more predictive data directly at the point of service to help expedite and improve the quality of repairs. Um, and while uh, the cost of repairs and topics we will talk about today are very important to fleets, uh, reducing downtime, better managing asset uh, maintenance, drives asset utilization, reduces, uh, as I said, downtime and works towards our ultimate goal, which is zero unplanned downtime for, for these very uh, very expensive and very important assets. Uh, so all in all, getting another two to five days per year for asset utilization really helps defray the cost of repairs, uh, getting trucks back on the road, and benefits everybody uh, from doing that. So again, thank you for the opportunity. That's what we do and look forward to digging in on the questions. So when I hear that, I think of the thing that I basically hear people say, if you, if you boil it all down, it's like, help me improve the repair process. And then additionally, help me to improve communication. And I think it's so important. You, you know, we talked about actionable insights. We talk about usable data. We talk about like measurably changing how much downtime we have and being able to measure that by unit. 
So that that is uh, all such an important piece to keeping commercial trucks and trailers on the road and you know doing the vital work that they do. As we've said many times before, the trucking industry is the backbone of society and it really does. The way I look at it is it not only does it help us keep the way of life going, but it actually is life-saving. So this work that we do to support the trucking industry is so very important. Nick, let me ask you something. When We've been at shows recently when we talk to people in the industry. You know, one of the things that our our clients and our colleagues say is that things are flat right now. And, you know, I think sometimes they're putting a little bit of a positive spin on that when they're saying things are flat because a lot of people are actually down. What do you think are the biggest factors driving our current situation in the trucking industry right now? I, I definitely agree that your clients and colleagues are correct there. You know, we're we're also seeing combined parts and labor costs staying relatively flat when we look at it year over year and quarter over quarter. Overall, we see this as good news for the fleets and service providers and maybe an indicator that inflationary pressures on parts pricing are easing and supply chains are returning to normal levels with more new trucks being placed in service. For a little bit of context there, um, here's a little bit of background on some of the data that we're tracking in that space. We currently report on 96% of total parts and labor costs 97% of total service activity from over 300,000 service and maintenance events managed each month on the Decisive SRM platform. Those service operations, we categorize them into 25 different VMRS system codes, and we publish and share that information quarterly. And for perspective, in our most recent report, the Q4 2023 Decisive Commercial Vehicle Service Analysis Report, we saw a 1.4% drop in combined parts and labor costs which reversed the upward trend that we had been seeing most recently in Q3 of 2023, where those costs had risen 2.1%. Yeah, that makes that makes sense to me that uh, when you combine those two, we're seeing a bit of a, of a drop because I look at it from the part side of the business and I know what's happening uh, for the first time in a long time. Price files are going out with price reductions. We hadn't seen that in a very long time. But tell me something, what's happening on the labor side and, and why? Well, Mainly when we've been uh, looking at the labor costs, we've seen those rise about 4% year over year. Uh, But that may sound big, but the news isn't actually that bad. Um, That increase is pretty much in line with the current rate of inflation. Again, we saw kind of increases in Q1 and Q3 of 2% and change in both of those quarters. Uh, While the labor costs here in this most recent quarter for Q4 actually decreased by 0.2%. So staying a little bit steady there. This is, I think this is a really important point and important part of this uh, overall analysis of cost. Clearly, we've got um, an industry-wide challenge for fleets and service providers to hire technicians. That's expected to continue as baby boomers age and fewer workers enter the vocational uh, education programs. The uh, BLS, uh, U.S. uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that diesel service technician employment is projected to grow 4%. 21 to, to 31, uh, created about 28,000 openings for technicians each year on average. So probably a, a, a big takeaway uh, and a bottom line here on cost is that uh, we really need more technicians uh, in this industry. Uh, and, and that, and without that, that will continue to drive up labor costs. Yeah, it's that old supply and demand thing. Um, the one I think there's a bit of a silver lining in this next generation. The Wall Street Journal's renamed Gen Z the tool belt generation. You know, over a 10 year period, we've seen a 15% decline in in college and university enrollment and a 50% increase in enrollment in trade schools. And that's primarily being driven by this Gen Z uh, younger group of people. What I find encouraging about that is hopefully that means more young people will be interested in the the uh, trades. The thing that I think as an industry we need to do a better job of is now compete with the other trades, right? So these these the tool belt generation, where are they going? Well, they might be going to electricians or plumbers or HVAC and not necessarily filling that diagnostic technician role. And if I remember correctly on the labor of statistics report, it said that those 28,000 jobs is basically just replacing all the people that are retiring. So if we do have any kind of measurable growth over the next 10 years, that'll be above and beyond the replacement. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe I believe so. And I think the other uh, potential silver lining is that uh, more and more of it's going to be uh, technical skills, not just repairing big, big, big items. And so 
for the generation coming up, I think that will uh, that will really drive them. And also the tools that are coming into the market uh, to help diagnosis, uh, predictive analytics, uh, prognostics, who you'll be able to identify what needs to be done. And I think that that group of people coming into the marketplace will very very much gravitate towards uh, the technical side, the technical tools that can that can help them. Let's hope. I I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Like I see. I see a lot of the Gen Z that are in my daughter's age group that I got to know while she was going through high school. She's going to be 20 soon. And, you know, they are, they're that digital native generation, that first completely digital native, right? The millennials, they kind of bridge the gap. Um, but these, these Gen Z kids, they grew up with technology in their hands at a very young age. And so when we're trying to get them to join our industry, being able to show them what the job actually will entail and how challenging it is and how Really, in many ways, it's exciting because no two days are the same, and you're always, always learning. So, yeah, let's let's hope that that continues to drive enrollment in our trade programs. I know at the Heavy Duty Parts Report, we just issued um, our first ever annual scholarship, and so we uh, gave out two scholarships to two students at WyoTech, trying to put our money where our mouth is and and really encourage young people to join our industry. That's the repair side of the equation. Let's talk about the part side of the equation. Nick, what are the current parts trends right now based on your recent commercial vehicle service analysis quarterly report? Let's go over those once uh, one more time. The uh, overall cost decrease we talked about with this most recent quarter dipping by 1.4% uh, was mainly driven largely by the parts costs. Those dropped by themselves around 2.2% quarter over quarter, and it's a 2.2% drop year over year as well when we look at parts just by themselves and the costs associated with those operations. These quarter over quarter and year over year parts cost decreases are good news for both fleets and service providers. Uh, we believe this may be an indicator that, again, I had mentioned earlier, inflationary pressures on parts pricing are easing, supply chains returning to normal, um, and, and truck getting back into service there. So I think things are, are running a little bit more smoothly and uh, you know, things assets aren't having to come back in as much for uh, some of the service events. Could it also be though that you know we've we've been quote unquote going through a freight recession like like volumes are definitely down across the board, and um, how do you see if there is a little bit of a resurgence of volume uh, over let's say truckload volumes go up in twenty five? What do you think is going to happen based on the current trends? I would definitely say that you know again, trucks are being used; they're coming in for service. New trucks are being introduced to the industry every day, every month. We do see different trends when we look at younger age trucks and what they're coming in for service wise uh, when kind of looking at the reports and the data versus some of those older trucks. Um, so as some of those trucks get older and older, you know, we may have more things uh, associated with how do I keep this vehicle on the road? So, you know, a lot of the, the repair events focusing on things like engine repairs, brakes, exhaust, stuff to keep things running, while maybe with some of the newer vehicles. Those aren't as much of the big problems. They aren't coming for those things. They may be coming in for things that are associated with warranty service. Again, when we kind of looked at some of the volumes and stuff in the past, we've seen trends where there's a higher amount of you know vehicles coming in for kind of cab and body related work. Well, those things are still covered under warranty. People are going to get those you know dings and dents replaced. While once they're older in service, that's less of a concern. We're going to focus more on how do we keep this thing up running on the road. And generating, you know, kind of value for the fleets and continuing to move that, you know, freight tonnage wherever it needs to go. So why is measuring all of this at the VMRS code level so important? And when we answer that question, I want you to think about two people. I want you to think about the uh, salespeople who maybe don't have as much experience with VMRS codes, or maybe the fleets that are a little bit smaller in size and scope and scale, and maybe they haven't integrated this into uh, the way that they manage their parts and service. I think one of the main benefits of being able to measure at that VMRS level is really tied to being able to bring everything to a standard and consistent definition. There's a lot of information, a lot of data that's captured in our platform and entered by a variety of people that can describe certain types of work in their own ways. The whole goal behind VMRS and, and some of those code key fields is really around how can we turn it into something that's standardized, consistent, where you can actually find more value in the information that's being provided there than maybe some of the, the freeform text that could uh, be applied to those operations and you know, the work that's happening on those assets. When being able to get it to that standardized definition, we're then able to better measure costs at that system level, enables us to accurately report on the parts and labor costs, 
And, you know, to your point with regards to, you know, the part sales folks or even the fleet users, a lot of them need to understand, like, what are the types of work we're doing? What are the things associated with that work? And, you know, how do we have the, the right elements in place? And being able to have a better understanding of the data there at the VMRS level helps give them, you know, kind of more insight into, you know, where are they spending the time? What is the type of work they're doing? Or even for fleets, what are their trucks going in for service for? Are certain things happening more frequently than others? Uh, they also have to have those VMRS codes to be able to submit some of that work for warranty purposes. So being able to kind of code things this VMRS level, I think just helps streamline that process across the board for service providers and fleets alike uh, to be able to, again, have a, a better understanding of what is happening with my assets? Where am I spending my money? Does that make sense? So along with the costs that we've talked about, we also kind of track this service level activity through the VMRS system codes as well to see like are certain types of activities spiking more than others, even if we just look at the overall volume. Um, and as an interesting fact, you know, the five most frequent service activities for Q4 are around power plant, which was around 20%, exhaust at 11%, cabin sheet mail at 11%, brakes at 7% of the volume, and lastly, cooling at 6%. Those are kind of the big five when it came to operation level volumes uh, in the most recent quarters report. So once you start categorizing this and you start to gain this information, Dick, what should fleets do uh, with all of this information? Yeah, I think that it's uh, uh, it's it's really important when you're when you're looking at um, the asset lifecycle, and I think Nick uh, certainly touched on this. If you can track not only uh, individual costs and trends, and not just trends um, across the industry relative to to parts and labor, uh, but trends specifically on assets, and I think that's really what uh, Nick was alluding to. You can start to see trucks get older. Which one should I take out of service? You know, what can I do relative to uh, preventive maintenance so that I can try to minimize some of these uh, costs are starting to grow uh, significantly. Can I change my uh, service cycles? Uh, those types of things. So I think this is a this data provides a real uh, good underpinning to understand uh, where the money is going uh, and what and and I think ultimately what can a fleet do about it. That that's really the the uh, the most important thing. Can they can they get us? Can they trade out a, an asset? Can they? focus on better maintenance uh, to reduce cost, uh, those types of things. So that would be my take. And then certainly um, relative to service providers, you know, that is more about uh, the things that you mentioned earlier, communication, workflow, expediting the repair, uh, and that will have a big impact on the overall cost of repairs. So you've been doing these reports for some time. Uh, what is the biggest surprise that came out of this report that we've been talking about right now? Yeah, so before I go there, let me just add to that last comment. So we're encouraging people to go look and, and uh, consume these reports. The place they can do that is at uh, decisivemarketplace.com. So these are free reports. Uh, they're produced on a quarterly basis. Nick does a great job. Um, and so you know, I encourage fleets and service providers to go up to that website and, and uh, consume that information. That's decisivemarketplace.com. We'll put the links in the show notes so that people can get a, a direct download. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, you know, back to your question, Jamie, about the biggest surprise. Probably the biggest surprise is that uh, it looks like there's uh, there's a consistent trend on the horizon. So really, no surprise. So we're we're certainly hopeful that the uh, parts prices continue to stabilize and and but and potentially come down. Some of the comments you made relative to labor, uh, we appreciate you putting scholarships into the marketplace uh, to help uh, to help that. Generally, um, both in terms of that and, and truck tonnage, we, we hopefully that will see that stabilize uh, as well. Uh, it certainly looks that way. These, these labor costs and technicians and finding new te and finding technicians to bring the marketplace to help stabilize the labor costs uh, is, is really important uh, going forward. So generally, good news is over the past, you know, <laughs> we've been living in a, in a bit of a nightmare for 36 months. Um, and it certainly appears we're on the back end of that and, uh, and things will stabilize across the board. Uh, one day I'll tell you the story of how I started my podcast and then uh, started my consulting business. And three months after I started my consulting business, the whole world shut down and I sat at home for three months going, my God, I think I've made a huge mistake. Fortunately, we're coming up to our five-year anniversary on the show and we did survive. But yeah, the to say that the last uh, few years have been dynamic and uh, really just, we just hadn't seen these kinds of events before. Like we'd seen sort of some of those things before, but never to the intensity that we have. So we've come a long way 
and uh, it's good that um, it is it is nice to see the trends appearing to stabilize because that can get maybe we can get back to some sort of normal. So, Dick, if there's one thing you want people to remember from today's conversation, what is that one thing? Yeah, you know, first of all, let me, let me say that um, uh, Decisive will continue this commitment to produce this report uh, and uh, then to do the analysis. You know, as Nick mentioned, we, we process a lot of service events on an annual basis in North America across uh, various different brands. So we will continue to produce it. Uh, I would say, you know, one thing to take away is that data is important. You know, as, as often been said, data is the new oil. Consuming data about trends um, and about information on the industry, uh, the information we provide, the information others provide, um, I think that's really important. And then to carry that theme forward uh, relative to data, we provide service management portals to our OEM partners. They deploy across their, their service networks, and it's virtually across the board in North America. They also make available to fleets a, a similar portal that connects them in with the service provider. And I, I would say that uh, being more proactive about service repairs and about consuming data and prognostics to inform uh, really what needs to be done, both from the service provider side and from the fleet side, uh, is, is, a, is a big takeaway for me. And, and just to summarize that, being very focused on tracking. So we provide uh, the ability for a, a fleet to track the service event, track the trends, provide line item approvals, see what's, what's taking place. Uh, connecting in electronically um, and also consuming that data to better inform what needs to be done is probably the biggest takeaway and the biggest opportunity over the next couple of years for fleets and for that matter, OEMs and, and others in our industry. You've been listening to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. I'm your host, Jamie Irvin, and we've been speaking with Dick Hyatt, CEO and President, and Nick Pittenger, Director of Data Services at Decisive. If you want to learn more about their company, go to decisive.com. Links are in the show notes. You want to download your copy of their report, go to decisivemarketplace.com. And I will also include that link in the show notes. Dick, thank you so much for taking some time to come on the Heavy Duty Parts Report. I really appreciate you. Jamie, thanks so much for giving us the opportunity. Uh, we love the work you're doing, as I mentioned before. Uh, Nick and I both very much appreciate your, your uh, giving us this opportunity. And Nick, thank you for wading into the details and putting them all together in a report that we can consume and use to uh, help the trucking industry. I appreciate your efforts as well. Thanks, Nick. Not a problem at all. Definitely uh, appreciate the opportunity here and love being able to talk about this stuff and, and help folks be able to take a lot of you know more meaningful action on the data that's happening throughout the ecosystem. Well, I hope you enjoyed this interview. And uh, I know that I took a lot of really pertinent information from it. I downloaded the report. If you want to get access to the report, again, you can go to heavydutypartsreport.com. And if you click on the show notes for this episode on our website, you will get the link to the report and you can download it directly and see the report for yourself. It's time for That's Not Heavy Duty. In this edition of That's Not Heavy Duty, I wanted to specifically talk about a all too common scenario that happens at the parts counter that is extremely frustrating for parts people and is also very difficult for new parts people who don't have a lot of experience. Let me explain what I mean. So it's really important for fleets and repair shops to keep their technicians, their qualified technicians who are probably overworked, it's important that they spend their time doing what they do best, which is diagnosing and repairing the commercial equipment. Therefore, these fleets and repair shops often will send junior staff or office staff down to their local parts counter, and uh, they, they send them down there to pick up a needed part. When this person, who doesn't have a lot of experience and is just really trying to help out, comes to the parts counter, they'll often say things like, I need an air valve. The parts person will say, for what? And at that point, there's often crickets. They don't know. They don't know where in the air system this valve is from. They don't know if it's a leveling valve. They don't know if it's a quick release valve. They don't know what kind of valve they need. They don't know what, whether it's for the truck or the trailer, what the year make model is. Um, and they don't even have a picture of the thing that they need, the valve that they need. And so if you're an experienced parts person, you can usually ask a few questions or you can get on the phone and phone the mechanic directly and get this information. And in a worst case scenario, you can even go to a catalog 
And, you know, from what you've gleaned from the conversation, you can open up the catalog, point to pictures and say, is this what you're looking for? Or they can go online and find those images and say, is this what you're looking for? And the person can say yes or no. This isn't a very accurate way of identifying parts, and it wastes a lot of time for everybody involved. So before you come down to a parts counter, do what you can to get as much information about what you need as possible. Things like, is it for a truck or a trailer? What's the year, make, and model? Sometimes that helps, sometimes that doesn't, but it's always good to have that information. When you are looking at something that is system specific, like the air system, the electrical system, the foundation brakes, the drive line, etc., make sure you understand what the function of the part is. So if it's a valve and it's a leveling valve for a trailer on the axles, or if it's a leveling valve on the truck on the drive axles, it's important to get that information. Now, if you're a mechanic, you're, you're sending this person down to save time because you're too busy, but this is where the five P's come into place, right? Proper planning prevents poor performance. So by taking just a minute to give this driver or this junior employee the needed information, it'll save everybody a lot of time. And it is, you know, going to greatly increase the odds that you get the right part the first time. That's the heavy duty way. Well, this brings this episode to a conclusion. I hope you enjoyed the episode. We've talked about a lot of things, everything from sales trends to parts costs to VMRS codes to how to properly identify a part when sending a junior employee down to your local parts department. I wanted to talk about one thing that is changing in the podcast world. It's not really related to heavy duty parts, but if you listen on Google Podcast, this affects you. So if you're an Android device user and you've been listening to the podcast on Google Podcasts, Google Podcasts is rapidly coming to an end. In fact, by the time you actually hear this, it's probably gone. So what do you do? We have a couple options. They've moved the podcast to YouTube. And because we have a video version of our podcast, you can find our podcast now in the podcast section on our YouTube channel. You can also find it on YouTube Music if you then click the podcast and search the heavy duty parts report. So if you're an Android user and you also like to use YouTube, you might as well just go and subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you'll have access to our podcast. I've included a link to our YouTube channel in the show notes of this episode. In addition to that, if you go to heavydutypartsreport.com, there is a, a banner just under the top part of the of the website on the homepage where it has a list of places you can subscribe to the show. And number two is YouTube. Now, if you want to have a podcast app that operates very similarly to the way that Google Podcasts did, you can also go to Pocket Cast. That's the one I use on my phone. I'm an Android user, and I really like it. It's very similar in function to Google Podcasts and very easy to set up on your phone. Again, I've included a link there. Now, If you don't want to miss out on any content that we put out, go over to our website, heavydutypartsreport.com and sign up to our weekly email. You get one email a week with all the content, and then you can listen to it on any platform you would like. Again, if you follow us and you watch the uh, video version, you can go to our YouTube channel and subscribe there, or you can continue to listen on the podcast player of your choice. If you do so, and it gives you the option for a five-star rating and review, That would be really, really appreciated if you gave us that five-star rating, gave us a great review. I've heard that helps us to expand the reach of the show. Thank you again for listening to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. I'm your host, Jamie Irvin. And as always, I want to conclude this episode by encouraging you to be heavy duty. Thank you for watching this video. Click here to subscribe to the Heavy Duty Parts Report YouTube channel and click here to watch another great episode.